a national perspective on things. Russell Baxter writes for Bleacher Report, and we're going to bring him on right now. Russell, how are you doing today? Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Good. So, obviously, a lot of this stuff with Byron Maxwell and the Dolphins and the Eagles have kind of, it's kind of just happened in a whirlwind over the last few hours. Kind of wanted to get your perspective off the top here, your thoughts on it. Well, I mean, you have to look at uh, the two players that the Eagles are, are looking to unload. Uh, you know, fairly disappointing for them last year. Obviously, Kiko Alonso was part of the LaShawn McCoy trade. And then Byron Maxwell got a lot of money and came in and, and frankly, struggled in, the, in an area where uh, the, the year before the Eagles struggled even worse. I mean, they've been horrendous against the pass the last couple of years. Uh, funny, they improved all the way to 28th this year, but offset that by being dead last in the league against a run. So um, defense is, is obviously a problem for them. Uh, I love the fact they brought in Jim Schwartz. They'll probably go to a 4-3 under him. Um, you know, they, they re-signed Malcolm Jenkins, who had a dynamite year. Uh, I think they'd, it be, behooved them to bring back Walter Thurmond and keep those safeties together. Um, so I, I don't think we're done seeing what the Eagles are going to do on the defensive side of the football, uh, not by a long shot. Russell uh, Baxter joining us here on 97.3 ESPN, the Sports Bash. Russell, uh, I know we don't know yet what draft picks the Eagles are getting in return. If you had to venture a guess, what, in your opinion, is somewhat a fair market value for what they're giving the Dolphins? Oh boy! You know, anytime you're you you're, tri- you're, you're anytime you're getting rid of players that you don't want, you probably don't get fair market value. Yeah, okay? understood. I mean, it's, like, it's, it's like selling a car with four flat tires. Okay, so, um, and in this day and age, uh, you know, it, it, it could be anything. It could even be picks into the following year, to be honest with you. Uh, but the most important thing is to get those picks to be honest with you, okay? I, a lot of times we focus on the fact that, oh, I think they only got a five, or they only got a, a, a seven. Well, those five and sevens adds up, uh, especially if you're trying to rebuild a team. I mean, you can get, listen, we know, you can get great players at one, Peyton Manning, you can get great players at 199, Tom Brady, okay? Uh, you can get players without even drafting them. Uh, London Fletcher, okay? Uh, you know, so there's all different ways. To me, it's not so much who gets the picks. I'm sorry, who, what picks you get, it's who's doing the drafting, okay? Um, there have been guys who, and teams, who are always see in the top 10 and they never get any better, and we see teams near the bottom who pick in the 20s and sometimes 30 and ideally 32, although it's 31 this year because of the New England situation and continue to stockpile their rosters. So, I, 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 you know, to even try to hazard a guess uh, would be hard. But, again, there's going to be a lot of shaping, and reshaping and modeling of that defense, and rightfully so. And, um, like I said, having that foundation with Jenkins and some of the other guys they have there, there are definitely pieces there. But, I mean, there's just been a lack of cohesion. Uh, I know some people like to blame Chip Kelly and the offense for the defense staying on the field, and I think there's a degree of validity to that. Um, but when you're constantly changing players on your defense, that's a problem as well. We're talking with Russell Baxter. You can follow him on Twitter at BAX Football Guru. That's Bax Football Guru, writer for Bleacher Report. I wanted to ask you about the Miami perspective. It seems like every offseason, Miami, for the last several years, has either thrown money at a player or tried to make a move for the player. And it seems like acquiring Byron Maxwell and Kiko Alonso just kind of falls within another move that they made that just kind of makes your head scratch a little bit. Well, yeah. uh, uh, I just alluded about changing players on defense. And, you know, the game of football is about continuity and consistency. And if you're constantly changing the pieces, you never get the puzzle finished. And, you know, Miami's done that for a while. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's kind of notable that the last time New England did not win the AFC East, it was the Dolphins who won the division. But the sad part about that, that, that was 2008. And the Dolphins haven't had even had a winning season since. And they are one of those teams that are constantly orchestrating trades. Um, sign- I mean, I, I have no problem with the Indominus Sioux signing from a year ago. 
Um, but, I mean, they brought in Greg Jennings, and now they cut Greg Jennings. Uh, they brought in Kenny Stills and probably need to get him more playing time. A couple years ago, they signed Mike Wallace, and he played more like Morley Safer. So, I mean, and he's no longer with the team. So, that's a bad joke, but unfortunately for the Dolphins, this constant buying and selling and selling and buying and not forming a good um, foundation, and the good teams have a foundation from their draft, is what constantly gets them in trouble. I mean, and listen, this isn't a football thing. It's, it, it's a sports thing. You, know, you guys know as well as anyone. Baseball, basketball, uh, probably less basketball because it's not a major, but baseball teams that go out and spend tons of money and, and reshape their roster every year, they never get any better. Russell, I uh, wanted to ask you about, obviously, the Eagles' offense uh, needs some work. And, and then on top of what's going down here with this trade involving Byron Maxwell and Kiko Alonso to the Dolphins, there's also reports that the Eagles have dangled out there DeMarco Murray and Ryan Matthews, uh, which would leave them just Darren Sproles and Kenyon Barner in the backfield pending some other moves that may take place. How likely is it, do you think, that either one of those players may not be on this roster come next season? Oh, boy. I mean, obviously, Doug Peterson and the new regime and all that are, are getting ready to make changes. They don't like what they saw last year. Um, you know, that, that's a tough call because I don't know if Darren Sproles can necessarily be your feature back, uh, you know, for 16 games. And I know Barner's there as well. And and um, I, I don't know. I mean, it would, it would be interesting to see if they let DeMarco Murray go, which I don't think they will. I, I, I think it's a pretty good bet to figure out where he's going to wind up back. We see a lot of that in free agency now where a player leaves a team and then he gets cut or, or, or and winds up back with a rod. I mean, ask the Bengals last year, all the guys they brought back. Um, I don't know. That, that's a tough call to me because uh, yeah, I'm sure Doug Peterson, who, you know, just like the Kansas City team, that went through a stable of running backs this year. They lost Jamal Charles and still were able to run the football. Alex Smith had a hand in that as well, but Spencer Ware, Charkandrick West, um, you know, are they going to draft a running back? I don't think they're going to go that you know that high and, and maybe draft a running back unless they that is the plan. But I, it's a good question. I'd be surprised if both of them were gone. As to who would leave, I don't know. Um, but I'd be surprised if both Matthews and Murray, if Matthews and Murray are both gone, then we're going to see an overhaul of epic proportion on both sides of the ball. Talking with Russell Baxter here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Eagles have a new head coach, Doug Peterson, has been making the rounds. I wanted to get your thoughts on, obviously, Peterson hasn't coached a game yet, so we really can't say much about Peterson but what about Howie Roseman, the guy who seems to be the man in charge now for the Eagles? What are your thoughts on this offseason so far? Well, it's very early. And, you know, we're in the what everybody affectionately knows, likes to call the, uh, the legal tampering period right now in terms of free agency. It all starts 4 p.m. Wednesday. Um, you know, they're, they're making some moves. I mean, the Bradford deal, I think, surprised some people. Um, you know, I didn't know if they were going to necessarily go that way. I, I, I thought... They, and, and they could still, um, you know, part ways with Mark Sanchez and maybe Doug Peterson brings in Chase Daniel, um, who he worked with in Kansas City. I mean, as you know, free agency is the ultimate game of uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You know, everybody, you know, lining up with people they work with, et cetera, et cetera, systems, uh, and so on. Um, but, I, again, it, it, it's very early in the process. Uh, you know, they re-signed Vinnie Curry, which I thought was a good move. Um, again, defensively, they just need so much help. And, you know, they've really – I mean, it, it's been a while since we've seen the Eagles with a quality defense. I mean, they really didn't have one the whole Chip Kelly era, the it, three years that it was. Um, and, and that hurt them greatly. And it, do, do we have to explain to people anymore, even though it's a quarterback-driven league, that it's really a quarterback driven into the ground league? You know, ask Cam Newton and the Carolina Panthers. Uh, Russell, as we look, uh, obviously it was a big day for, you know, fans of this game, whether you liked him or not, Peyton Manning uh, retiring after 18 seasons. And when you look back over what he did for the game, what he brought to the game, and really how he changed the game. I mean, shotgun was, go up there and try to see if you can get the defense off balance. He used it as, show me what you're going to do 
and I'll pick it apart. Try to put, if you can, into words what he meant to this league, where it's going forward, how it'll look back, and perhaps at times show its evolution from what he brought to it. Um, as a person, and I'm talking about myself, who loves what he does, and I've been doing this a long time, I get a kick out of watching anybody who has enormous passion for what they do. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Passion is passion. Um, and anybody who saw Peyton today understands how much he's going to miss the whole football experience, not just the playing, the camaraderie, the meeting with coaches, the meeting with opponents, the game plan, the preparation. It's going to be, it's going to be hard for him, I'm sure, because it's something that he loves. And anytime I think you lose something that you love, um, it's a tough transition. Uh, as gracious as, as a person you'll ever see during his speech today, uh, thanks so many people. I, I got a huge kick out of you know, him saying that uh, he'll miss shaking Tom Brady's hand and he'll miss the New England fans um, and the fans should miss him because they got so many wins against him. You know, he kept his sense of humor. Um, you know, he kept his emotions in check, although he, wasn't very, he was very emotional. But it's not so much what Peyton brought to the game to me, it's what he brought back to the game. And, you know, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember the, uh, you know, the Terry Bradshaws in, in the 70s and then later Jim Kelly in the 90s, quarterbacks that called their own plays. Uh, you know, Peyton Manning was an offensive coordinator uh, throwing the football. Uh, there were years where, um, you know, I, I remember in 2009 when Jim Caldwell um, was the head coach. Uh, for the Colts, and uh, you know, you remember Jim Caldwell, who did, did a great job with the Lions last year after a missable start. Um, you know, very quiet, very subdued, even quieter than Tony Dungy. And I remember kidding people that Peyton could be the first person in NFL history uh, to be uh, Offensive Player of the Year, MVP, and Coach of the Year, um, because he really <laughs> was the leader of the Colts team. That's not a, a knocking Jim Caldwell; he was just very, very subdued. Um, again, when you see that kind of love and passion for something you do, and you saw it with him today, and he got two rounds, of, you know, he got two rounds of applause um, from the media, and he addressed all the questions. Even a question was thrown at him about, you know, his past, and I thought he handled that very well. But I, I think we're going to miss him um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, we've gotten used to him, and again, he has his critics. Uh, but even his critics had to admire the way he said goodbye today. Russell, I wanted to ask you real quick. You know, Manning is a guy who a lot of people have different opinions about, but I think the one thing that we all can agree on is that Peyton Manning changed the way we look at the quarterback position. It seemed like for years, quarterbacks, it was always about their arm strength, their moxie, their clutch. And Manning came in, he wasn't the strongest arm, he wasn't the most talented physically. That was Ryan Leaf that year when they were drafted. But Manning was the smartest guy, and I think that Peyton Manning has forever changed the fact that we don't just look at quarterbacks physically, we look at them mentally. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know if he necessarily changed that aspect, okay? But what I think he really did was he made quarterbacks around the league up their game. Okay, listen, more talented guys, guys who could throw farther, faster. Um, you know, remember early in his career, Peyton Manning, you know, an out pattern was a pick six. Okay, and he, you know, I, I can remember the year that they, Colts finally won their first Super Bowl, well, the Super Bowl with him, I should say, in 2006. And I remember one of the knocks on him the off season. Remember in 2005, uh, you know, they kind of slumped down the stretch, had a, you know, looked like they were going to be in the Super Bowl. The Steelers went into um, Indianapolis and upset them. I remember Manning was sacked five times in that game, and, and Manning didn't get sacked a lot. He managed to avoid sacks. Um, and he talked about being more mobile. And I remember his first game in 2006, he played against his brother um, at the Meadowlands against the Giants, and you could see it. He was rolling out and doing things he hadn't done. Always looking to get better. And because he was always looking to get better – the quarterbacks around him were always looking to get better. And, I mean, listen, he can say all the stories he wants. But over the next weeks and when we get close to the season and he's not around, 
you're going to hear the stories of the preparation. Some people thought he, he you know, he drove his teammates um, a little crazy with all the preparation. But as he said today, the goal was to do the best he could do, okay? And he wasn't this and he wasn't that and he wasn't this, but he wasn't going to be out-prepared. And to be honest with you, his speech epitomized that today because his, his speech was pretty prepared. All right, Russell, I want to bring you back to the uh, to the Eagles situation here. Obviously, they got Sam Bradford under contract now for two years. I thought it was a, a pretty favorable deal the way the Eagles were able to get it done. Um, what do you make of Sam Bradford after what you saw last year, and is he the right choice for what the Eagles got him to do? Well, I mean, unfortunately, the Eagles quarterback situation these last couple of years, it's hard to, hard to judge um, because of the system they played in. I mean, it, it, the last two years, the Eagles starting quarterbacks have just as many, just a, almost as many turnovers as they do touchdown passes. Uh, what was Sam Bradford last year? 19 touchdown passes and, and 17 turnovers. Uh, Mark Sanchez, I think, was what four touchdown passes and uh, or five or four, whatever it was the year before. Remember Nick Foles, 13 touchdown passes, 13 interceptions. Yep. Sanchez, 14 touchdown passes, 14. I'm sorry, 14, 13 turnovers, 14 turnovers. Um, it's going to be different with Doug Peterson in that system. So. Uh, listen, for the most part, the biggest knock on Sam Bradford has not been performance. It's been reliability, and, of course, he missed two games last year. So, I mean, first things first, can he stay on the field for 16 games like he did when he was named Rookie of the Year in 2010, like he did in 2012 when he had a decent season? You know, we haven't seen a lot of Sam Bradford since. He missed 25, he's missed 27 games the last three years, I believe. Russell, one more question before we let you go. A little bit of a national NFL perspective. Is there a, a team or teams that you're looking at coming into NFL free agency, which is starting up this week, that you're saying that's a team that's going to be very active and you're going to you're expecting a lot of movement from them? Well, I mean, the obvious suspects would be, you know, Jacksonville and Oakland. They have the most capped room. Um, but and what's interesting to me is watching the Los Angeles Rams. Um because they didn't have a lot of cap issues over the last couple of weeks, and yet they jettisoned some notable players. James Laurinaitis, Chris Long, um, Jared Cook. They put the franchise label on Trumaine Johnson. Janoris Jenkins could wind up leaving if he gets a good deal, and he's already kind of scoffed at the money that the Rams have talked to him about. So there, there might be one. I mean, we, listen, you, you, Oakland, Jacksonville, Rams. Okay, the Raiders haven't been in the playoffs since 2002. The Jaguars haven't been there since 2007. The Rams haven't been there since 2004. Okay, um, spending money is great. Spending money, getting drafting good players, and using that money to secure their services is even better. And that's what those franchises have to do. I thought Jacksonville took some major steps forward last year. I thought the Raiders took some major steps forward last year. They both have young quarterbacks. Who's the Rams quarterback? That, uh, unfortunately, that that remains a big question mark for them. Remember last year, they, the Foles for Bradford trade? I'll have to remind you of that. And it worked out so well, they benched him and put Case Keenum in. Russell Baxter, you can follow him on Twitter at BAX Football Guru. That's Bax Football Guru. Columnist for Bleacher Report. Really appreciate you joining us on the Sports Bash today. You got it, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Russell.